perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start. Hi, Caitlin, seven of us. Yeah, it feels a little weird. So I'm going to just introduce myself for a moment and then I'll um, open this thing because um, I can't see you. I can see the comments box and I can't really see what I'm um, doing. So I'll just do it like this. Um, okay, let me just put this like, in, okay, so then you can see the banner. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. So um, sh shared screen, not full screen. What do you what do you mean, Rico? Yeah, I know. I know this is not full screen right now, but when I yeah, yeah, yeah I know I'm going to put it. Um, I'm going to put it in full screen in a bit just so I can talk to you guys for a second before I start the presentation. Um, OK, so I'm going to start this hi everyone again for those of you who just joined in i hope you're um we're just having a little chat i was asking everyone uh where are you from and everything like that so that we can start the presentation um my name is susanna i am a portuguese clinical psychologist i'm also a free diver and i was invited by Scuba Digital to talk to you a little bit about the psychology of freediving. And so um, what I can say regarding myself, uh, I finished my master's degree in 2018. And since then, I've been studying a little bit about um, psychology stuff that I uh, enjoy. I just finished a postgraduate degree in uh, psychological intervention in crisis in emergency settings and i'm studying now criminology and criminal investigation um which is something that i want to pursue in the future professionally um and so besides that i've been focusing a lot in the psychology of freediving because i've been freediving since i was 21 i guess and i've always heard when I started freediving, I hope you all know what freediving is. If you don't, just let me know in the comments box because I'll explain it. Um, I'm assuming you know because you're all probably scuba divers or you are enthusiasts about the um, the scuba diving world and the diving world in general. So um, I was very interested in freediving for a long time. I actually uh, was invited to a podcast and I talked a little bit about this. It's called the Freediving Cafe. Freedive Cafe. Uh, it's really interesting if you want to get to know a little bit about the freediving world. Um, many, many very um, interesting conversations about all the physiology of freediving, psychology of freediving, um, science regarding the marine world, um, ocean conservation and preservation of the species. species. And I um, I talked a little bit about this and I always, when I started freediving, I always heard that freediving is such a mental sport. Like we're all, we're every day, like we, we perform and we, we go and do our dives. And if we're not on the right mindset, we just can't do anything. Like our body can't follow our mind. And the other way around, it's kind of like more uh, when your body is not on the right state, it feels a bit, a little bit impossible for for us to run a mile, for instance. But when our mind is on is not on the right mindset, it's kind of like it's it's really difficult for our body to follow it. And so, when I was diving for the first time, my instructor told me, uh, "You have to be calm. Like you have to be relaxed. You can't go down and dive and just think about." many things you, you can't you can't just do that because this is a very mental sport and this is a sport that plays with your mind and you have to know how to control it and how to self-regulate or your emotions and i was kind of like confused about that because i'm i've always been like a very i don't know i i didn't even think that it would be such a, a mental sport like many of the athletes that i've interviewed um, to this investigation uh, said it's a mental sport is how they um, characterize it. I know mental, it's kind of like a synonym for 
crazy in some, I think it's in the UK. Um, but I, I, I find this, uh, I find this um, description kind of funny because if you put it that way, it's both a crazy sport and a mental sport because it plays with your psychological, um, it, it plays with your psychological uh, components and it's, it's really, it's really a, a psychological um, sport. Sorry about this. Okay, um, and so I started freediving, and then I, a year later, I was to conclude my master's degree in clinical psychology. And here in Portugal, we're asked to write a dissertation in the end of our master's degree. And I knew that I didn't want to write something for a whole year that I really didn't like or that I wasn't really interested in. I was kind of going back and forth thinking about all the things that I could write about and um, I couldn't find anything and suddenly I was having dinner with my parents and my mom who hates sports and who hates freediving. She told me, hey, she doesn't hate freediving but she has like, she's really, um, she panics when I go to the, to the ocean. I think every mother is like this but uh, she was like, oh, you should write about freediving, the psychology of freediving and I was like, what what's that and so now i'm gonna share the whole screen um and so that i can okay i hope you're listening um she asked she told me that and i was like i'm gonna research what free dive and psychology next to each other i'm i'm not sure what i'm gonna find out but i will try and figure out something because I'm listening from all parts from my instructors from my freediving buddies from my parents from because freediving must have some psychology to it and I know that at this point I know that the psychology of the sports psychology is a huge world I know that there are components of psychology really present in football in tennis and in every sport that we can watch on TV or that we have practiced when we were kids. So I tried to research this and nothing came up. And so I was kind of like, okay, how will I write a dissertation about this? This is a good starting point, but how will I write a pioneer study on something there is no there, there's no information about this I think there was only one article uh, online regarding the psychological characteristics of freediving athletes um, but it was so it, it was really interesting and it was scientifically valuable but it wasn't something that um, I could like hold on to and do something beyond it and so i i tried to um research a little bit more um and nothing would came up and so i started talking with my supervisor i started talking to um other psychologists that would uh, that were writing um articles on sports psychology at the time and i was like okay i have my theme wonderful i'll research something for a whole year um, this is something that I'm very passionate about. So I think for it personally, and Laura, if you're watching and, um, you're a psychology too, a psychologist too, I think that you motivation, it has to write a dissertation, an article. If you're a scientific, if you're a science driven person, and even in psychology, we have so many articles coming out every day. Um, and so many studies and so many investigations. And if you want to write something, you have to be passionate about it because motivation has to be intrinsic motivation and internal factors must drive you. And if you're doing something for a whole year, for instance, I'm talking a dissertation. If you're doing something for a whole year that you're not passionate about, there are two way out. So ways out. So if, if it will not be as good as you as it, as you would expect it or you will be very unmotivated and you'll probably never want to look at it again and okay it's done and you start not liking psychology so much or your course or you know so 
it's it's I, I've had people tell me writing a dissertation is so emotionally exhausting. Um, I was so tired afterwards. Uh, I was just like, okay, I don't like clinical psychology. I'm gonna turn into uh, human resources. I, I didn't want to feel that way. So free dive, my passion, and psychology, another one of my passion. Um, together, it was perfect. So I started it. And so what I wanted to prove, basically, I hope you are not seeing this little window, um, little tab beneath the slide. Otherwise, you can you won't be able to see um, the things that I've written um, under the slide. But okay. Um, so what I wanted to prove regarding the psychology of freediving was that the freediving this sport had psychological components attached to it and that athletes could enhance their performances through the um, use of psychological strategies and I have my dissertation here because I can I couldn't find my iPad I'm really sorry um, but um, I wanted to pr prove that I'm sorry I wanted to prove that psychological strategies can enhance athletes performances and so um, these strategies could be applied either in training sessions or in competition scenarios so it wouldn't be exclusive to training but while competing these strategies would would play an important role in the performance of the athlete and so started talking about this with my supervisor um, he was I had the I was lucky enough to have a, a really good supervisor and he was he supported me a lot throughout this whole process. He was very interested. He he actually told me from the beginning what you do is completely insane. I don't know how anyone would hold their breath for 4 minutes, 5 minutes, 6 minutes and I don't know why people do this for fun. It's it was really interesting his vision um i don't know why people do this for fun i think it's completely insane but great study you go ahead it's 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 cool and then it was it was a really good relationship between me and my supervisor and he was always always really interested in what i had to um show him and I think it was because it was a pioneer study. It was really well received. Well received this, this idea at the beginning, uh, the initial idea, it was really well received by the community. And so everyone uh, who I talked to uh, was really motivated to participate or to just given some sort of information that could be useful to the process of writing it. And so I interviewed 20 professional athletes, 20 professional freedivers, and from 15 nationalities, from Belgium, Port Portugal, Finland, Russia, like all around the world, Philippines, and they were national record holders and world record holders. So they had previously hold records or they, the records were theirs at the time of the interview in all the freediving disciplines. I don't know if you are fam um, familiar with the freediving, different freediving disciplines. We have dif different disciplines with fins, no fins, um, in the ocean, in the pool. So all of this, this these disciplines were uh, present in my sampling group. And they were um, the disciplines in which the athletes had their records. And we came up with um, six, seven, I can't, oh, perfect. Uh, there were seven um, main themes that we came up um, during the brainstorm sessions that we had uh, in, in regarding my, my supervisor. And we had come up to a conclusion that we should ask seven major themes. And the themes that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is the last 
three of this list, which are the psychology characteristics and traits a freediver should have, um, a challenging and dangerous situations and coping mechanisms regarding the freediving performances in training sessions and in competition scenarios, and a challenging sport, both physical and psychological. This was the conclusion that we came to. Um, and I'm going to focus more about the psychological strategies um, regarding this sport, because I think it will be a really good um, starting point for, for um, to talk a little bit about the importance of mental health in sports, because it's something that it's very underrated and put under the rug. And so if you are a, a really good football player, you shouldn't feel sad. You just stick to playing football. You shouldn't feel sad because you have lots of money and um, your mind can't affect your your performance. I mean, that this idea is completely wrong. Um, and especially today that we're going through all of this, um, the, the, the scenario of pandemic and um, COVID-19 situation, mental health is being widely talked about and so we are coming we, we are realizing slowly that it plays an important part a huge part a crucial part in our lifestyle and in your in our well-being so um it's completely wrong to think that an athlete can't be affected by psychological um components and psychological struggles and so that's why i wanted to prove that Psychological strategies might enhance the uh, performance in freediving and also at, at the same time um, that psychological training should be present in an athlete's training sessions and in competition scenarios. So these are all the questions that I um, that I asked. I'm not going to read them to you, obviously. I started kind of like with the, the history um, in the story of the athlete, um, when he or she started to do freediving, just to get them to get them a little bit in the um, environment that we were trying to create. Um, and oh, just to clarify something, I, I interviewed twenty professional freedivers in Portugal. The at least in psychology, the m average number of interviews would be for a new theme i think it would be um nine ten for a really studied um, already studied team uh theme it would be maybe four or five 20 was not a mistake i would do it all over again i would do it differently because each interview was about an hour and a half and yeah, so do the math, an hour and a half times 20. It was really, and I didn't even do 20 because I, I, I did 25 and then I just wrote, I had to type them down. I, I wrote 20. So it was, it was a good sampling group because it was a pioneer study. So I thought, and I thought I, I needed a bigger sampling group, but I, I if I, would do this differently i don't know but um it was a long time so all of these questions <laughs> an hour and a half uh it was a tiring process but it was really worth it because we came to very interesting conclusions um conclusions which i never thought i would achieve um and so i started to uh talk a little bit about the history of uh, the athlete. Um, I talked about the importance of having a coach. We discussed um, the success in freediving competitions and for freediving in competitions in records. Um, and then we started talking a little bit about the psychology, like here is psychological preparation, um, the differences between psychological preparation and um, the between training sessions and competition scenarios and if they struggle with psychological issues and these question this question was really interesting do you consider a freediving should have specific uh, psychological characteristics because every time i'd ask this um they would all say calm 
and so define calm uh, and if they said calm some some would say oh it, they should be calm but they wouldn't perform and or include any psychological strategies in their training plan so it would be kind of this discrepancy between answers and it was really it was great to analyze that um, afterwards and yeah these are all the questions and so one of the conclusion that we found uh, regarding the psychological preparation I put here a picture of a yoga session but this doesn't necessarily mean that psychological preparation is solely and exclusively yoga it's not so um, <laughs> yoga is a is a part of a relaxation uh, it's kind of a relaxation exercise that you can do to enhance your performance in many other sports and also in freediving it seems to work so um, I put it here because it's easier for people to understand um, that it's a it's part of the relaxation training and part of the psychological preparation that an athlete can do because freediving um, it it, it's a breathing sport. It's a sport where you have to have a really huge control uh, in your breathing system and in your breathing process. Um, you can't breathe normally to perform and to do a dive and to compete. You have to learn how to breathe properly and you have to learn how to control your breath. And you also have to control many other variables that might be present in the environment, such as stress or outside noise or people um, cheering you or people talking to you when you don't want to be bothered and when you just want to focus and concentrate for a dive. You have to manage all that. And on top of that, you have to hold your breath, which is kind of like not something that we naturally do we weren't like breathing is something that we do to survive and freediving being a and i wouldn't say there's a, a really huge dis discussion regarding these um concepts but i wouldn't say freediving is an adventure sport and i wouldn't say freediving is a dangerous sport for me it's not a dangerous sport i would say freediver uh, freediving is a sport of risk because you are depriving yourself from a vital function of your body because you're not breathing. And so this doesn't mean it has to be dangerous, but because it's not. And if you do it with safety, um, it's, it's not dangerous, um, contrary to many what many people believe. Um, and so I put this here, yoga, so that it's um, more um, easy to comprehend that this is a part of the training session and the psychological preparation, but it's not exclusively the only preparation that an athlete does. So regarding the psychological preparation, it was really interesting to see that from the sampling group, 20 freedivers, just one freediver told me that she doesn't do any psychological preparation. She doesn't. Um, it was the first one of the first questions that I asked, do you do any psychological preparation? No, I don't do any. I'm just realistic, as you can see here from the quote. I love this quote. It seems that I love it because it's so it's it's kind of like people who don't who do psychological prep who include any psychological strategies or exercises in their training plan they're may they're crazy like i'm just realistic you know so it always it, it also puts weight on the stigma that we have regarding mental health which is like if you're crazy you go to a psychologist no i'm telling you <laughs> in 20 in the 21st century you're crazy if you don't go to a psychologist. This is what me and my psychologist um, colleagues um, say to each other. And we, we, I worked recently in a psychiatric, psychiatric clinic and all my pa patients were kind of like, they were um, suffering a lot with the stigma of mental health and um, of being in, this environment where people treated them like they were quote unquote crazy and this was something that was talked about in the clinic 
we, my supervisors and other psychologists and psychiatric um, uh, and psychiatrists and I mean, everyone would say like, why? You are crazy in the 21st century. You're crazy if you don't go to a psychologist, not the other way around. Of course, this is not like this. Um, I think you get what I'm saying, but um, I'm just realistic. It's like, it, it's it's putting the weight on the uh, the realness of the performance solely on physical aspects. And it's not it's not like this. Fortunately, there are 19 free divers, 95% of the sampling group use psychological strategies before, during, and after uh, performances, both in training plan, training sessions, I'm sorry, there's a typo, uh, mistake, and um, competition scenarios. So yay, yay for me. I was really happy <laughs> to, to know this. Um, and it was kind of like, when I got to these numbers, I was like, okay, uh, we have proven something that psychological strategies must be present and they are present. And so let's investigate which psychological uh, strategies are present in these training plans and when do they do them and if they enhance their performances, do they feel like they enhance their performances? So it's, it's kind of like um, trying to see all the all the aspects of, of their training plan and it was it was a really huge process so we started by autogenic training it was the first um psychological strategy um mentioned by one of the athletes and um if you don't know what autogenic training is i it it, it if it this athlete felt like it had a positive impact on his performance um and he was a world record holder so as soon as he started including autogenic training in his um training sessions it 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 had a positive um impact on his performance autogenic training includes self talk let's put it this way um you repeat sentences to yourself and you can change your behavioral patterns through the repetition of this these sentences so basically it's it's this it's a huge process it's a huge practice it has many components it has many singularities but um you you can um it's basically if you, you can reframe your behavior by um saying certain sentences to yourself and um it holds i'm i'm seeing here it holds four major components which is relax release replace and reframe to what i was saying reframe your cognitive um processes not cognitive processes but the way you face uh, a stressful situation and for instance um, this in this case regarding freediving, and you can change that by repeating those sentences. And so, this athlete in particular used this autogenic training. But I had another athlete who told me, "I don't like to cheat my mind. I don't like to say you are so calm. My legs are so calm. My arms are so calm and so relaxed. I am so calmed. I am breathing correctly when I'm not." And so I like to feel my emotions. I like to feel that stress. And I don't like to um, cheat my mind. So I like to feel it and I like to let it go. And that's called mindfulness. And that's called being self-aware of the, sorry, of the uh, body, of your body and of your body uh, sensations. So, um, Self-awareness, uh, another really, really um, used technique, if you would say, um, by freedivers, being aware of your own body, of your own feelings, of your own sensations, of what happening, of what's happening on your body, um, and how you can control it in order not to for it not to uh, affect your performance. Visualization. This was the most um talked and used and reported technique by freedivers 16 athletes 
And so visualization is a really realistic, it, it's different. It, it's di really different from imagination because when you're imagining, you are kind of like seeing things or or stuck in an idea or imagining something or thinking about it. How am I going to do this? I'm going to do it like this. If I imagine my dive, I can be here and just, I don't know, be on my phone and at the same time thinking about, oh, I'm going to go there and I'm going to do my duck dive. I'm going to dive down. I think it will be OK. Yeah. Visualization is has nothing to do with imagination, and it's a really realistic progress um, and process in which you think about every single step of a dive. In this case, a dive. You can use visualization in many other um, in many other tasks in your life or in many other sports. In freediving, and I'm going to talk specifically about freediving, visualization is the process of thinking about every single step from the beginning to the end um, in order to become familiar with this um, process and with also um, stressful variables that I was talking previously, with stressful variables um, that might be present in the environment. For instance, if you feel like you are being, um, if you feel like you are not comfortable with people um, talking to you in in um, during a uh, before a dive, imagine you're you're on a boat and you go to your diving spot and then your coach is talking to you and everyone's making so much noise. And through visualization, you can visualize that and you can control that in order to become familiar. You, you visualize it so many times. It's such a repetitive process that when you actually go and do a dive, that bothers you less or it doesn't bother you at all because you've, you've visualized it, you, you've, you've seen it, you have thought about it and you are familiar with it. And so you've learned gradually how to control it and how to not let you affect affect you, not let it affect you. I'm sorry. So I've I, I really like these two quotes that I'm gonna read a little just briefly to you um, regarding the visualization process. I have no idea why this image is so unclear. I'm sorry. It was really HD when I um, I don't know. Um, so the visualiz visualization process, uh, I imagine I lay down, uh, I lay on the surface, I breathe, I listen to my breathing, I do the last two breaths, then I dive down, I do the duck dive, I see the rope, and it's just imagination. When I go down, I see the rope and I try to, to imagine how nice it is when I glide through the water, I feel the water over my face flowing. Um, and this is literally translated, uh, transcripted, so I couldn't um, modify anything regarding the uh, quotes. So I'm reading exactly how they said in the interviews with ums and with eh and with everything. Um, and so it's so wonderful when I go down and this nice blue color of the sea. And when I start free falling, which is a process in which there is um, a uh, negative buoyancy and so you you go down on the rope and you don't have to basically do anything other than equalize and try to relax and um it's not as simple as this but it's basically the pro you reach a certain point in the rope and you start free falling just like in skydiving so um you start free falling uh down and then you reach the bottom plate and then you come up and swim up again. Um, and I imagine that my body is relaxed and I'm, tr I'm just free falling or falling. And I try to put each detail of the dive in my, in my visualization. So this athlete is describing um, his uh, visualization process. He even imagine, it, it, not imagine, but you know what I mean? I, he, he thinks about, the um every single detail and even the emotions he feels so it's a very a very detailed process and at the same time um it's 
it's kind of like he, he, he talks about, it's kind of like a switch. You start your dive and you immediately, you are immediately in this movie, the movie you saw a hundred times before. So again, the process of becoming familiar with all these variables, your emotions, your uh, being, and being also aware in the visualization process. So you can imagine or think about or visualize um, yourself on the rope and doing the dive, and you can visualize, for instance, your if you if you know you struggle at a certain depth, you can visualize your emotions. Um, and your body uh, sensations and feelings uh, at a certain depth. If you know that you get nervous, you can visualize yourself getting nervous. But at the same time, as you imagine that and as you visualize that, you also visualize yourself being calm and being relaxed. Why? Because that's the result that you want to achieve. And so it's really interesting, these, um, these, uh, the, this, this technique, it's a, it's a very, it's not something that it's, gonna be easy to do from the beginning but um another step by step so i visualize meter per meter every single part of the dive mentally which is basically the process of um, visualization that i am trying to uh, that i am explaining to you guys so meter per, per meter every single um part of the dive and trying to connect the feeling that I'm going to perceive and the sickness that the body is going to give me at a specific meter. So from the beginning, the most critical part is the end of the dive. I'm visualizing the dive. It's like if I'm visualizing the dive, it's like I'm going to I'm doing the dive already, but I'm just visualizing. I try to remove negative thoughts because I know that at some point I will be getting thoughts that will me, maybe try to make me give up. But I visualize the feelings and the depth distance meter by meter. Um, and so my brain is actually doing it. My brain is prepared. If I visualize, it's not going to be the first time. It's, and, and this is interesting because it's, it's not. It's going to be physically the first time, but mentally it's going to be the hundredth time. So another psychological strategy or, or um, technique is recreating the, compet the competition environment in a training session. That is, you can do every single part of a competition event um, and apply it to a training session with your coach and with your freediving buddies and with your safety uh, freedivers uh, in order to become familiar with that environment. So you can have the noise around you. You can recreate um, the uh, countdown um, to a dive. and. It's it's interesting because it it's every, it's you, what you want is to become familiar with all these variables that might have an impact on your stress levels on the competition day, and so if you tell your coach, okay, do the countdown, and when you do the countdown, I'll have to go down, I'll have to perform like if I was in a competition. This will gradually decrease your stress levels and your anxiety. And when you go and when you are in a competition scenario and when you when you are in a competition event, this might have um, this technique might have a um, positive impact and uh, decrease that anxiety that is perfectly normal and inherent of um, competition scenarios. So you can also train in different scenarios. I uh, interviewed an athlete who was, uh, who is, yeah, who is a record holder in one of the disciplines. And she told me that she trains static, um, uh, static, uh, the discipline of static, which is basically um, staying still and holding your breath um, with her kids around her. So screaming, making noise, grabbing her hair. Why? Because she wants to, once again, become familiar with her body sensations and with her body feelings and becoming aware of her body in different scenarios so that when she goes to the pool and when she performs and when she is staying still and holding her breath, it becomes easier because she trained previously in more difficult scenarios. 
And relaxation is another um, technique, which is curious because relaxation training increases self-awareness and relaxation might be um, autogenic training is part of the relaxation training and other um, other psychological techniques that we're going to see are part of the relaxation training. So relaxation might do, might be yoga, uh, specific breathing exercises. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like a, a mix of many other strategies. And we have also auto-suggestion, which is basically to narrow it down, repeating things to yourself. Um, it's a form of self-talk, um, but it's, it's, it's different because in, in auto-suggestion, you, um, it's kind of like a part of autogenic training. In auto-suggestion, you do all these things that I've done, I, I've said to you previously, for instance, you repeat phrases, you repeat, um, um, sentences uh, and words, but it's not like an autogenic training. Autogenic training, you have a, a um, let's say, specific guidelines to do all these trainings. And it's not just auto-suggestion or self-talk or um, inducing a, 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 um, a behavioral state through words and sentences. And auto-suggestion is specifically telling yourself that you are calm, telling yourself that you are relaxed, and all these um, suggestions that you do to yourself. And we have also NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. NLP is a delicate subject because it is not a... It is, it is a pseudoscience, and so it can have... It can have uh, an impact, a positive impact on you, but it's not scientifically um, proven or or um, it's it's not a it's not a scientifically proven method. And so uh, there's a lot of um, controversy regarding NLP. Um, and so if you want to research about it, I I. The, what I know from NLP uh, is what I've researched, and um, I, I can't give you an informed uh, opinion about it. I've read so many things um, that say wonders about NLP. I've read so many things that don't don't that, that say the exact opposite. Um, and it was not created by psychologists. It was not created by people who had a um, knowledge in in this area so it's a, it's a pseudoscience so it's it's another um but it, it the aim of it is to basically neurolinguistic programming is to reframe your cognitive maps through uh words and through the linguistic um parts of uh to, through the lingu linguistic process um very it's not very complex but it's there are whole courses about this uh i try not to talk that much about it in my presentations because i feel like i don't know enough about this method and honestly i i prefer knowing <laughs> about other ones uh better and so asrm not asmr okay it's athlete self-report method which is basically a dive log um and dive logs can be really uh important because uh, i'm gonna read something regarding a dive log uh here um because well you can actually um record not record but monitor your performance um and keep track of your um performances in training sessions and also in competitions, but more in training, this was more used in training sessions. Uh, you can keep track of your process and so that you can look at it afterwards. 
and see what you've done wrong, what you want to improve, what you would like to achieve, uh, what you feel like it wasn't something that you did uh, in the right way. And so it allows you to analyze your dives um, in, in, um, in group with your coach, for instance. Um, and it's, oh, it's really late. I have to hurry up. Uh, and so um, you can keep track of everything. Your nutrition plan, your dives specifically, and this this should be a block where you um, where you uh, should pay more attention to if you're a free diver. But you can put in nutrition, em emotions, of course, psychological preparation, psychological strategies that you use, other psychological strategies that you use, and you felt like it wasn't. Um, it wasn't something that uh, be you, bened you benefited from. And so one athlete mentioned psychotherapy. Why? Because she was in a situation, um, really traumatic situation. Um, and she mentioned psychotherapy because she was in therapy for a long time after that situation occurred. And so obviously it had a, a really positive impact on her performances afterwards and um, on her life in general because it was she was kind of suffering from PTSD and it helped post-traumatic stress disorder I'm sorry and um, it helped it really helped and she is uh, she has obviously partially recovered from that it was a really traumatic situation and so but psychotherapy in this case shouldn't and does not have to be solely exclusive for um for uh, people who have suffered some sort of trauma or have experienced some sort of traumatic situation it can be if you are not achieving what you would like to achieve um i wouldn't say psychotherapy but you can go to uh, an appointment of clinical psychology or to some counseling in order to um psychotherapy is more of a um it's a more of a complex um, progress and you process and you might not need it. But um, regarding to psychotherapy, it might also help you to if you feel like there are some mental blocks, like many athletes uh, like to to call and uh, to to refer to. And if there are some things that you have in your thoughts while you are diving that you can't get rid of, not rid of, but you can let go of them. Uh, and so, yeah, psychotherapy, always helpful. Uh, one of the best methods, I would say, but I am, I'm a suspect. Um, Relaxation, again, throughout a performance. So the athlete must be relaxed. Mantras, they can be sentences, words, music. You can sing to your, not really sing because you're underwater. And if you sing, water will go in your mouth and then it will go wrong. But you can sing in your head uh, specific songs and um, just have your own mantra. It's not, it's not uh, something that it's, the same mantra for any everyone you will have your own and it will come up uh, for instance when i'm um, doing static um static apnea which i really like which was the discipline in which i told you that you have to be still and in a pool uh, or in the ocean there are people ha who practice them in the ocean it's just very interesting i've never done but um in the pool you're still you're holding your breath and you have to be relaxed and so certain songs come up in my head um lately lately not lately last year was the same song all over again I was trying to think of other song it was dire straits all over again all over again and it's complicated when you have a song as a mantra because for me when I don't know the lyrics I feel stressed and anxiety and then my contractions come up and so <laughs> and so um yeah, songs, sentences, whatever suits you. Thinking about a scenario um, that you like, for instance, um, a landscape, or thinking if that you are in a warm place or some place that brings you comfort. Um, 
I use this technique a lot with my patients, uh, which is called the safe, safe, safe. For me, I call them in my colleagues, we call them safe space technique. Um, and it's basically an imagery technique where you visualize yourself in a comfort, comfortable scenario for you. Um, and body scanning, which is basically being aware of your own body, but, but doing this in a very gradual scale. For instance, um, starting in your head and then going through your neck, your shoulders, your torso, your, your arms, um, and basically being aware of all the sensations. But when you do this scanning, you're thinking, oh, okay, my neck, my neck is relaxed, and then you relax it my shoulders i have to relax my shoulders then you relax it and then you basically do a scan in order to relax every part of your body and then self-talk which is different from auto suggestion it's a part it's it's similar but it's it has its similar components but it's kind of different because in self-talk you can talk to yourself uh you don't have to uh repeat anything but you can say okay i'm calm i'm gonna do this okay i, I will do this I'll, go, I'll do fine. It's going to be fine. And so these sentences or uh, anything that you feel like you need to talk to yourself and to say to yourself in order to, and this can be throughout a performance. Um, you can actually talk it out or you can think about it. Um, yeah. So self-talk, it, it's a, it's a, um, it, the, I've, I, I want to tell you that this investigation is online. You can search psychology and freediving and you will um, you will uh, find it. But if you don't find it, uh, just let me know. Email me or through LinkedIn or Facebook. I will send you the file. And I'm actually writing an article about this. This is was my dissertation, but I'm writing a whole article about that, this in order to publish it. And you can find this online if you want to uh, read it in more detail. It has 50 pages and I'm just trying to sum it up a little bit. Um, so within the sampling group, we found that six freedivers do not struggle psychologically while training, uh, while training or competing. So no psychological struggles awesome or is it uh and two freedivers uh have experienced physical and psychological constraints constraints so um not uh, kind of like these mental blocks as they would like to uh call them and to to refer to and 60 percent of the freedivers um have experienced and experience psychological struggles. So more than 50% of the, actually 70% of the uh, sampling group struggle with psychological um, aspects. And so one aspect, I'm not gonna lose or, or spend too much time on this. Um, I don't wanna make this really, this presentation really uh, <laughs> boring, but, I think that in every sport, in every single sport, when you are young and when you are trying to compete and when you are um, beginning in this sport, or in, this, in that specific sport, um, you are always focused. And this is not always. If you, it depends also on your personality and what you would like to achieve with practicing that sport. But you are focused on numbers and you're focused on competition. And if, especially if you're a competitive person, uh, this might affect you. And in the beginning, you can be really focused on numbers. And these freedivers, it's actually two. Um, there, there were more freedivers that mentioned this, but I really like the quotes from these two athletes, athlete 11 and athlete 8. Um, and um, they felt like they were permanently thinking about numbers and others' expectations. And this, and this increased um, their stress levels and their anxiety. And this can also lead to um, not wanting to perform anymore, to wanting to quit. Um, if the motivation, as I was saying before in the beginning, to write a dissertation, you have to be passionate about it. And the motivation needs to come from within you. you ha it has to be intrinsic, internal motiv motivation, not external. You can't be driven or you can be, you can find a balance. Uh, you can be driven for, uh, from um, 
external variables such as money, status, you know, but you have to find a balance. If you're not motivedly, mo motivated internally to do something like this, which requires a lot of effort and a lot of um, motivation, you, you won't be as successful. And so freediving, it's the same, it's the same. It's not it's the same as writing a dissertation, but it's the same process and everything in our life that requires effort, uh, it's like this. And so you have to be internally motivated to do so and to, um, to, to be in the sport and not to feel like you are competing solely for the records and the medals and the money and the sponsorships. And so it can be stressful, um, but as, as this athlete said, I started freediving and I started to get records right away. So he felt like he was um, getting it. He felt like he was achieving what he set himself to do. And so when I started to get records, I, f I was feeling like I was just competing because of people's ex expectations. Freediving to me was like freedom in the beginning. And because of the records, I started to look at it more as a job. So I quit competing for a while and now I'm competing again. Maybe if I didn't stop back then, I'd be in a different and higher level now. But because when I was a teenager, I was always thinking about being a champion. And this is natural. This is good. But at a certain point, you, when you see that you become a champion and you have good money and sponsors, you also see that happiness doesn't come from those things. I one of the biggest rewards I've encountered during this um, during this process was the dialogue that I had with these athletes was so incredibly valuable. Like these quotes that I've just showed you, they characterize like immensely what I'm trying to explain. Sometimes it's, I feel like in my presentations, I feel like it's more valuable to read these quotes and to refer to them um, and to specifically read what freedivers told me, as they told me, um, than explaining in my own words what I'm trying to say. Because it's, it was one of the things that if you read the dissertation, you'll read the dialogues, it's, it's an amazing adventure and it's an amazing, it's kind of like, it's a story. Um, I really like um, these um, dialogues and these quotes. Psychological or physical. So we've come to an end. What I asked freedivers, what did they think about um, regarding freediving? Was it physical or was it psychological? So was it solely a physical sport that required physical um, uh, effort and or, or was it a, a, a sport that required psychological components solely or was it both? So 15 freedivers, 15 freedivers told me that they think that freediving only requires psychological preparation. and or and or told me that they give more importance to psychological preparation then we have three free divers that say that they do both and they think it's a it's a 50 50 sport it's it has its, its physical components it has its psychological components and two free divers said that there are no psychological preparation whatsoever in free diving um there doesn't need to be and they only think about physical preparation. Um, I had one free diving, one, one free diver uh, tell me that free diving is just psychological. It's only psychological, it's only mental, uh, and you don't need to, to do any physical preparation. I was really impressed by this statement. Um, when you think of an athlete, you think of a it, you when you think think about it think about a sport you always think about the physical part you never think about the psychological preparation but a training plan should have at least some of these or other psychological strategies so it has the physical part and because you have to be physically fit and adapted to the sport especially in free diving you have to have a 
very good control in your breathing system and you have to be prepared physically to it but in um in psychological in 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 free diving we also have psychological components and in football again in tennis again in any other sport that you find you'll have psychological components and you should include them in your training sessions you should include them in your com in the competition scenarios and um yeah if you want to read um, more about it i will uh i would uh give you more uh, I, I you can read it in more detail but the aim is that you find if you're a freediver or two freedivers in general a balance between um a between both psychological and physical strategies and that you come up with a plan that includes both of these um of these sets of exercises and the most crucial part is for athletes to understand what fits their training plan and what strategies suit their goals preferences and needs and so this what is a strategy to some people might not be a strategy to others and you have to find um and and that's the the, the beauty of the sports psychology and with uh, and of the other um psychology um let me see you guys oh so man <laughs> i <laughs> Okay, um, so it's it's the beauty of psychology and the beauty of um, other other. Uh, let me just think. Oh, perfect. No, not perfect. And so we let me. Are you seeing my screen share? No. Okay, you're seeing me. Okay um it's the beauty of psychology it's the beauty of sports psychology it's the beauty of free diving i'm sorry for my um english sometimes during this presentation i've been talking portuguese all weekend it was exhausting switching my brain to um to portuguese and yeah i hope you liked it i hope um that you found this interesting it was very rewarding doing this presentation it's very um it's it's wonderful to to share it with you guys um and if you have any questions i would be happy to answer them if i can um i don't know how much time i have left but we're 11 so yeah thank you so much uh, i hope you liked it thank you yeah, Laura, it was a, a huge amount of data <laughs> and a huge amount of uh, headaches back then, but it was worth it. It's really interesting to see all the all the variables. It was conclusion that we I, I didn't um, think I would I would find or come to. Do you have any questions, guys? Do you train in Portugal? What would you recommend for someone who would like to start? Yeah, I train in Portugal. I think Portugal um, is a, a one of the countries that are, has been growing um, gradually in freediving. Uh, we still have a lot to learn, of course. Um, there are other countries that have really strong strong athletes we do too as well um but we are still trying to grow uh, a little bit in this world um because it's it's ironic because we have so many beaches and so many a, a huge extension of ocean and the uh, coast in portugal um and scuba diving is uh really present in every school um but free diving uh it's not so much but i do train in portugal i have two instructors i have free diving buddies it's so much fun um and we're trying to grow up so it's awesome uh what would you recommend for someone who would like to start um just try and find if you would like to start um just try to um try to 
find a school that has some sort of courses near you and just go from there. You, you, your instructor should do should tell you what's best for you um, regarding uh, your training. I'm sorry, I, my my thing is. Uh, your instructors should tell you what you you should do. You should take the first course, and then you you go from there. Um, thank you so much, Laura. I wanted to do a scuba desert. Well, it's not these themes in clinical psychology uh, here in Portugal. They're not that well perceived. Uh, it was well perceived by my supervisor, but then when I was presenting it to the panel to the jury i mean yeah they wanted to look at other research uh, not so much about uh sports and everything because this was not a, a sports psychology thesis this was actually clinical psychology because i talked a little bit i talked so much about the um psychological strategies um from a, cl a clinical point of view, so um, any if you if anyone reads the, the dissertation, they will understand this. I mean, it's not a sports psychology thesis, but um, it's not it's not that well received. But it was it was really worth it. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Laura. Auto suggestion: What are you telling yourself? Do you use this kind of technique in your own training preps? Um, yeah, I do use it. Um, what are you telling yourself rico are you talking specifically about me um auto suggestion can be you can induce your let's say your behavior through suggestions it's as simple as this you tell yourself you suggest yourself that you are in a certain state um and then your behavioral your behavior will follow let's say you are really nervous and through auto suggestion you say i'm so calm i'm so calm i'm so calm i am calm i'm relaxed and by saying this it's not as simple as this you 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 should um uh there are other parts of this training sorry there are other parts of this training um that you can do uh, it's more complex than just saying this you also have to regulate your breathing and you have to play with other strategies as well but um you can become calmer and more relaxed through um telling yourself these uh, suggestions per se the water is really cold and most <laughs> most free divers are mostly for spare fishing well this is a mis um a misconception because free diving when i'm talking free diving i'm not talking about snorkeling nor free nor spare fishing i'm talking about the sport where you go down on a rope grab the tag on the bottom plate and come up again swimming. So it's not a spare fishing. I know what you're talking about because free dive equal apnea. It's not. It's not like that. It's it, it, it's kind of it's kind of different, you know. Um, but um, I'm not talking about spare fishing. But it's true that spare fishing uses uh, that spare fishing is apnea. So uh, yeah, the water is. The water is really cold, but you get used to it. Don't worry. It's kind of like the cold is psychological. I'm just kidding. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not psychological. Um, okay, guys. If you don't have any more questions, um, you can email me. You can search me on my Instagram or Facebook. I have a Facebook page called the Psychology of Freediving. Uh, I've done a project during quarantine, uh, which is called Quarantine with a Freediver. I'm still um, releasing and putting out some videos about that, um, and which we, in which we talked to, I talked to freedivers regarding their experience through quarantine and how they dealt with being stuck at home and not being able to train in the ocean and how it affected them. Um, it was interesting and I'm still putting out episodes because I don't know. I actually know if you're from the UK, Belgium and Australia and well, Turkey, I don't know, but if you're from these countries that I've stated, 
you're still we're all still struggling with a lot of cases every day and some of us will be experiencing quarantine again so it's very actual the it's very um a present the the project quarantine with a freediver so i'll still be putting out episodes and they will be as useful as they were in the past back in april when this was all um emerging in portugal so if you want to check that out feel free i'm gonna uh, end the session here if you don't have any more questions i want to thank you all very much for um being here and for uh, listening to me talk for an hour endlessly, as uh, I hope you're not feeling tired. I'm gonna have a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, and thank you so much. And I'll see you around. Maybe, maybe free diving. I hope I, I've convinced you to come to this sport. Okay, thank you guys. Bye.